Hello, Disobey, and thanks for coming. My name is Mikko, and uh, if you know who I am, you probably know me as the old fart who goes around carrying a five and quarter inch floppy disk on him at all times. So I've stopped doing that instead of carrying a five and quarter inch floppy disk, which is getting old. I started carrying an eight inch floppy disk. <laughs> huh? How's this? And these are so old, I mean, I'm old. I've never used an eight inch floppy disk myself professionally. I have used, like actually working at F-Secure, I've actually used five and quarter inch floppy disks for real. I've also started carrying uh, punch tape. So if anybody wants punch tape later today, I have plenty of that and punch cards. There's so many people here in the audience who started hacking much, much later than any of this technology was around us. World is changing because of technology. Technology shapes our world, shapes our crises, shapes our conflicts, and it shapes our wars. And all these changes are happening very quickly. We're actually very lucky to be alive right now. These are very exciting times. Technology has never been moving so quickly as it is moving right now. But one thing bothers me a bit. If you go to your computer, you open up your browser, then you open up the history list and just browse through where have you been lately? What kind of websites have you been visiting over the last week? Where have you been surfing the web over the last days? Well, you'll see that there's probably some news sites. And if you're local, for example, living here in Finland, those probably are Finnish local news sites in your own language. Sure. But then everything else, everything else, including the cloud services and the search engines and the social media websites, are coming from United States of America. And this is a bit weird. This is actually really weird, especially when you consider that the operating system that you're running on your device, many of us would be running, again, an operating system made in United States of America because the majority is running Windows and OS X or on your mobile device, Android or iOS, all made in USA. So the services we use, the operating systems we run, and the chips, the CPUs on our devices are coming from Intel, AMD, or Qualcomm from the United States. And this is a bit surprising, because when you look at the actual statistics on Internet users, United States of America isn't important at all. The majority of Internet users are coming from everywhere else except from USA, everywhere else except North America. In fact, North America could disappear from the Internet and there would be no significant dent in the amount of users at all. There are more users, obviously, in Asia. Asia has as many users as the rest of the world combined. But even Europe, Africa and Latin America have more users online today. And so isn't it a bit weird imbalance that we have right here. United States of America is the king of the internet, but they create these services, hardware, CPUs, and operating systems for everyone else. The rest of the world relies on them. And I was thinking about this last week, because last week we got the quarterly results from the largest technology companies in the world. The largest technology company in the world is Apple. Apple is the second most valuable company in the world based on their stock value, and they're quickly reaching Saudi Aramco, which is the most valuable public company in the world. Now, in the quarterly results and the combined results for the year 2019, Apple mentioned in passing that they now have a little over one and a half billion active devices. One and a half billion active devices running Apple operating systems, running OS X or iOS. And that's a big number, but exactly how big a number is that? Well, a day later, we got the 2019 results 
from another technology company, another over a billion dollars valued company, Microsoft. And in their details, they mentioned that they now have almost one and a half billion active devices. Apple has bypassed Microsoft. Apple is now bigger than Microsoft when you look at the amount of active devices, you act actual devices in use by the users. And yes, before you ask me, this does include Xboxes and it does include all ATMs running Windows. All active devices running Windows, there's less of those than active devices running an operating system from Apple. And this is historic. It's sort of similar to what we saw last summer. Because in the summer of 2019, for the very first time in our statistics at F-Secure, we saw that there's more malicious traffic on the internet generated from Linux-based devices than from Windows-based devices. This is largely thanks to the Internet of Things, because all these insecure coffee machines and doorbells are running some god-awful old Linux distribution, and they are generating massive amounts of network traffic. But nevertheless, it is historic times. Microsoft and Windows has been the king of the hill for two decades, and now things are changing. So we are more and more reliant on technology, more and more reliant on the internet. But this is nothing new. Technology shapes our world. Technology shapes the way we live. And if you think about other big shifts, it's easy to compare this shift of going to the online world to the shift which happened a little over 100 years ago, 150 years ago, which was electricity. When electricity became mainstream and they started actually, for example, putting electricity grid in Helsinki, which means you got electric light and you got radio, obviously that was a very, very big shift. And very quickly, in two or three decades, we became reliant on electricity. Today, our society, every society, runs on electricity. And the easiest way to take down a society today is to cut electricity and you keep it down for a week or two or three. That's it. Within a week, things start happening because we can't do anything without electricity. We lose all communication capability, including our mobile phones. We don't know what's going on. We can't get information. We can't move around. We can't fill gas in our cars. We can't travel, we can't get food. So electricity is a great example of an innovation which made us very, very reliant on that innovation. We can't live without it anymore. But of course, we wouldn't want to go back either. Electricity has brought us so much. Everything around us runs on electricity. We wouldn't trade it for anything. And exactly the same thing is happening with Internet right now. Yes, internet has brought us so much good, so much connectivity, so much entertainment, so much business, and so many new risks, so many new threats. But most importantly, we are becoming as reliant on internet as we are on electricity. Eventually, everything that we plug into the electricity grid, we will also be plugging into the internet grid. And just like today, our society will not be able to function without electricity. In a matter of years, our society will not be able to function without internet. In some respects, it's already happening today. Within 10 years, within 20 years, it's going to be as bad as losing access to electricity grid. And this is a trade-off. We are trading safety for great new benefits. We did that with electricity. We are doing that with the internet right, right now. So what are the biggest risks for us online? Is it the foreign intelligence agencies or foreign militaries or activists or terrorists? Well, no, it is criminals. Online crime continues to be 
the biggest single problem we have. The vast, vast majority of the problems we fight and we see at our customer base are obviously coming from organized crime gangs. Gangs which buy and sell stolen information, which use ransom trojans and password theft, which use services in the Tor Hidden service to sell stolen goods, to sell stolen passwords, to sell stolen dumps, that's credit card information, and offer you services where they will buy stuff illegally and sell it further or launder your money for yourself. As I was going through different online marketplaces in the Tor Hidden service, there's actually one which really interested me. It's called uh, Trump Dumps. Yeah, there's a website which is selling stolen credit card information called Trump's Dumps. And this made me thinking, who is the richest hacker in the world? Who's the richest hacker in the world? Maybe the richest hacker in the world is um, <laughs> this guy. That's Yevgeny Nikulin. Yevgeny Nikulin, who uh, hacked most of you. This is the LinkedIn hacker, guy who uh, broke into LinkedIn and stole the whole user base. I'm guessing most of us are on LinkedIn or were on LinkedIn when he did his hack in 2016. And you saw him driving around the Moscow ring roads with his Audi R8 and his Lamborghini. Sure, he made a lot of money, but maybe he's not as rich as um, Karim Baratov, who probably also hacked many of us here as well. I'm guessing most of us have at some point had a Yahoo account. He's the Yahoo hacker, a Russian guy from Toronto who was hacking uh, services a couple of years ago. Here's a picture from his yard. So he made clearly a lot of money. But then again, maybe he's not the richest hacker. Maybe the richest hacker is uh, Igor Turasev, also known as Tiger who was one of the heads of the so-called Drydex, also known as Evil Corp gang, which is a gang operated from Moscow, which was involved in many of the ransom Trojan operations we've been fighting over the last five years. The Drydex Trojan have been used to drop all kinds of ransom Trojans on infected machines. That logo right there in the hood of the Nissan Skyline GTR is the logo of the Evil Corp team. And the gang themselves preferred Lamborghinis and Audi R8s. Here's actually a video clip of one of the gang members showing off his Audi R8 in Moscow. The building you see in the background is the uh, Office of the Justice in Moscow, and he's doing donuts outside. So these guys have made a lot of money, but then again, these are all Russians. I'm sure we have rich criminals, online hackers from somewhere else. Maybe the best contender might be this guy. This is Ismaila Mustafa. However, Ismaila has not been convicted of anything. So he's just allegedly involved in business email compromise attacks, you know, CEO scams, large-scale attacks targeting companies trying to fool the employees of these companies to wire money to outside accounts. How much money has he made? Well, I went to look at his Instagram. This is Mumfa. Here's Mumfa with his Mercedes. Here's Mumfa with his other Mercedes. Here's Mumfa with his Ferrari. It looks like a Lamborghini because it's yellow, but it's actually a Ferrari. And here he is with his Lamborghini, which is red, and it looks like a Ferrari, and his McLaren, and his Rolls Royce. And they always say that crime doesn't pay, right? So, who is the richest hacker in the world? Well, this is a trick question, of course. 
Of course, it's a trick question, because the richest hacker in the world by far is Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Because he's the 29th richest man in the world. And as we read from newspapers three weeks ago, he allegedly sent a WhatsApp message which contained a video to this guy. And this is Jeff Bezos, the number one richest guy in the world. And allegedly, this WhatsApp message contained an exploit which took over Jeff Bezos' phone. And all of this happened five months before Mohammed bin Salman was involved in murdering this guy, Jamal Khashoggi. And he, Jamal Khashoggi, was working for Jeff Bezos at the time, because he is a journalist. He was writing for Washington Post, and Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. And this all sounds like a movie plot or something just things that we, we, we find hard to believe it's actually happening for real. But that's nothing new. It sounded like a movie plot when we learned three years ago that North Korea is launching attacks against Sony Pictures because Sony Pictures is about to release a movie which laughs at the dictator of North Korea. Yet, that was true. So governments are involved in the attacks we see, but the attacks coming from governments don't typically target normal people. They target people like Jeff Bezos. They target unusual people. They target unusual organizations. Normal organizations have nothing worth stealing by a nation state intelligence agency. Some companies do, but they are rare. So most companies are never targeted by foreign governments. And today, intelligence agencies wouldn't be doing their job if they already wouldn't have physical moles, people working inside of the largest cloud and social media providers in the world. Our data is in the cloud. Our data is at AWS, in Azure, in Google Cloud Engine. That's where it is. Intelligence agencies know this very well. And they know that it's hard to break into the services run by Amazon, Microsoft, or Google, because Amazon, Microsoft, and Google spend hundreds of millions to secure their networks. Yet, they have to gain access. So the easiest way has got to be to just get your people recruited to work inside of these organizations. Last year, I was visiting Google, and I, I, I mentioned this as we were having lunch with Google guys and girls. I just you know, brought it up that, you know, the, the, what do you think about the problem of moles, like you know, foreign intelligence agencies working inside of Google? And they were all like, yeah, it, it probably happens. And then they were looking around the table at each other like, And this isn't just theoretical. Again, going back to Saudi Arabia, there has been arrests of Saudi intelligent agents working inside of Twitter. In fact, one of the three arrests of the Saudi uh, agents who were working for Saudi government and were working inside of Twitter, one of them actually left Twitter before they were arrested and went to work for Amazon. I wonder why. Why were these guys working at Twitter? Well, of course, they were trying to find dissidents who tweet things against the Saudi government. That's who, were, who they were trying to find. Why did one of them leave Twitter and go to work for Amazon? Well, we don't know, but that's where AWS is. So yeah, cyber operations are very real. This really is happening around us, and most of this is Invisible. So if you want to, to want to learn how it actually feels like when your organization is targeted by a foreign government, we have to speak to the people who were there when it happened. So a friend of mine, Andy Jones, wrote a book last year, this book right here, Surviving the Extinction Event. He speaks about what it feels like when you are 
inside an organization when things really go bad. Because he knows. Because Andy was the chief information security officer for Marsk when not Petya went through their networks. And the book paints a great picture about how it went down. When it actually started, um, Andy was having an offsite with his people, IT staff, in a hotel 10 minutes away from their headquarters. Marsk is a Danish company. Their IT operations are run from the United Kingdom. Andy was in the UK, which, which is where his office is. So he was in this offsite with his key people when the phone rings and he gets the first word about the ransomware Trojan going through their networks. So he leaves the meeting right away, gets into his car, drives the 10 minute drive to the headquarters. During that 10 minutes, they lost 90% of their infrastructure. That's how fast it was. And then it was bad. Like, they soon realized that you know, most of their computers are overwritten. Most of their laptops are gone. Most of their desktops are gone. Most of their servers are gone. All of their ADs are gone. Their phones are empty. Like, they're trying to call to their country offices to check what the situation is, then they can't call them. Their desk phones are voice over IP phones. They don't work. Of course they don't work because it's voice over IP. So they use their normal iPhones, but their phone lists, the address book is empty because ADs are down. And you don't remember the phone numbers of your people. Of course you don't remember the phone numbers because they are in your phone. And how many of you have printed out your address book on a piece of paper so you could have it in case your phone doesn't work? Nobody does that. Nobody does that except the people who have gone through it. They realize that having your phone book on a piece of paper is, is worth, worth its weight in cold when your ADs go down. And of course, we never assume that all of our ADs would go down at the same time, but that's exactly what happened here. There's a great part in his book where Andy describes that he's uh, they realize just how bad it is, that they've lost everything. And then he sits back in his chair and starts thinking that, okay, you know, we've lost everything. Now, is it just us? Is it just our company? Or is it the whole world? As far as they can see, it could be the whole world. It could be that every single Windows machine on the planet has been overwritten. Because from their point of view, everything they can see is gone. And then he looks out the window and he sees cars driving by and tram operation and people walking in and out of shops. And then he realized, okay, it's not the whole world, it's just us. But, you know, just think about that. And for a moment, it seemed plausible that the whole world has gone down. And there's a great question Andy asks in his book, practical question. A question you would ask when you are in the middle of something like this, when the massive scale of the attack against your company becomes public, when it hits the news, when every newspaper is writing about this massively large, massively large attack and uses your company as an example of a company which has been hit bad. What happens next is that everybody wants to talk to you. Your phone is ringing off the hook. Every regulator wants to talk to you right now. Every intelligence agency wants to talk to you right now. Every client wants to talk to you right now. Like, what do you do? He actually doesn't answer the question in his book. So I asked him, I asked him, Andy, I mean, you lived through it. Like, tell me, what did you do? And he said, well, you know, they had to make, they had to make some calls about what to do. So they, they made a call that, you know, we are a Danish company. So we will only speak with the Danish police. We will only speak with the Danish regulator. We will only speak with the Danish cert. We will only speak with the Danish intelligence. Everyone else who calls, we direct them to those. That's what, that's what they did in practice. But once again, it's something you can think through beforehand and have a plan, so then you are ready when your phone starts ringing off the hook. So in Slush, three months ago, we announced 
a new major project for machine learning and artificial intelligence that we've been developing inside F-Secure. And machine learning is shaping our world, the world of computer security, right now more than any other technology. And it has been doing it for many years already. Every single security company, every single large security company is relying on machine learning right now. And it seems to me that machine learning is becoming a similar technology like electricity and internet. It's going to become so important that we will become reliant on it. And within decades, we can't function. Our societies can't function without these mechanisms. And machine learning is problematic because when, when it becomes advanced enough, we humans can't understand it anymore. And I'm not speaking about general, wide, superhuman AI. I'm speaking about narrow AI, like, you know, Google search. Google engineers don't really understand anymore how Google search works. Because it's been teaching itself for a decade. It's getting all this data and learning more and more. And it works like a charm. You know it. When you go Googling, it sort of guesses what you're, what you're thinking about. It, that's how good it is. But not a single human anymore understands exactly how it does the guessing. So these narrow examples of machine learning are everywhere around us. And there's plenty of great research being done in this space. This is one of the slides I have where I know that it doesn't matter what I speak during the slide because nobody's listening to me. Everybody's just watching the morphing faces. You know, this is what machines can do when machines learn. This is very interesting research, which actually has been done like 100 meters from here. This is from NVIDIA, NVIDIA Finland. So Jaakko Lahtinen, Tero Karra, Samuli Laine, Timo Aila, these guys do world-class research on technologies like these, like how to create human-like things. And this looks like science fiction in many ways. So let's play a clip from a science fiction movie. Hey, what's coming? Double homicide, one male, one female. Killer's male, white, 40s. Set up a perimeter and tell them we're on route. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks. Give the man his hand. You are now under arrest for a future murder. This is Minority Report. Speaks about pre-crime based on a Philip K. Dick story from 1956. So 70 years old story, which plots a picture of pre-crime where technology is so good that we can detect crime before it happens. So we can arrest murderers before they murder. So we can arrest innocent criminals. Innocent criminals. Why am I speaking about this? Because last night, I was scrolling through the talks which we will be hearing later this month at the RSA conference in San Francisco, unless it's going to get cancelled because of the coronavirus. But if it's going to go through, it's well, RSA is the biggest single event in computer security with 50,000 or almost 50,000 people attending. And as I was scrolling through the talks, I noticed that there was a talk called pre-crime detection using predictive policing systems. For real. I mean, there's a talk about pre-crime in RSA in two weeks. So we are crossing borders that we've never crossed before. We are using machine learning. This talks about machine learning to detect crimes before they are committed. Machine learnings that detect murder before it's murdered. You are under arrest for a future murder. Huh. And when we look at other narrow machine learning areas, of course, the things that have been built by Tesla are interesting. This is a real clip. This is what Tesla, the cars, actually see when they are driving around on their own. That's straight from... This is published by Tesla themselves as an example of the data they collect for machine vision for self-driving car functionality in current generation Tesla cars. It looks pretty neat, but it does remind me of something.
I don't know if any of you have a hobby of pausing movies when they show a display of a computer or something like this, like, you know, HUD or things like that. But if you actually do it in Terminator and you zoom in on the details, for example, here we see 6502 assembly. That's basically Commodore 64. Actually, you, if you Google for it, this is Apple II assembly code shown on screen in Terminator, which is kind of neat. Got to love it. But if technology enables us to do artificial seeing and artificial hearing and generation of human-like data, which is completely artificial, of course, it can also be used for bad. Like I said, all security companies use machine learning. We've been using machine learning since 2005. What we haven't seen yet is attackers using machine learnings or machine learning mechanisms to do attacks. Yes, they are trying to poison our machine learning systems. They are attacking the machine learning systems used by the defenders. That is absolutely happening and has been happening for a while. But that's a different thing from actually using machine learning to launch attacks, launching, I don't know, a botnet which would learn how to avoid detection and then would morph its operation to better avoid detection or things like that. Things which are absolutely doable, but which hasn't been done before. However, there was one um, news piece recently about a real-world attack, which would have been using machine learning. And that was about deepfakes. Now, yeah, deepfakes are not real. I suppose that's, that's pretty given. And when I speak about deepfakes, we probably mostly know deepfake video, where you can fake, uh, fake visuals. So, for example, in a clip done by a guy called Control Shift Face, we have a clip from the legendary Shining movie with the original Jack Nicholson playing it, and then a deep fake of Jim Carrey in the same scene. And it is, it's weird. It's the kind of technology that would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. And today, I mean, this is done by one guy in, at his home, all right? So what's the link to crime? Well, the headline we saw last year was that fraudsters have now started using machine learning and deep fake mechanisms for phishing attacks. And I know, in particular, business email compromise attacks. So you get a phone call and it's your boss. And it, he asks you to do things. And of course you do them because it's your boss. But then later on you realize that it wasn't the boss, it was a deep fake voice. And this happened last year, and I'm calling bullshit on this. I don't think this happened. I don't think this is real. Is it technically doable? Yes. Could it be done? Yes. Did it happen here? I don't think so. I don't believe this until we see some evidence. So why am I calling bullshit on this? Because there are so many easier explanations. Sure. Attackers could create a deep fake generator for CEO of a company and then call, I don't know, the CFO of the company and pretend to be him through a deep fake generator. But it's probably easier just to get a guy who sounds like him. And even more importantly, when people fall for business email compromise scams, they become ashamed. And they become ashamed for a reason. Because whenever we read headlines about some company falling for a business email compromise scam, we laugh at them. Like, what an idiot falling for a Nigerian scam. Or, how stupid do you have to be to wire the company's money away? That's what we say. So we are blaming the victims, and I hate that. I hate blaming the victims. But as long as we blame the victims for falling to a scam which actually might not be that simple to begin with, then they, the victims will come up with excuses. And that's what I think happened here. The victims most likely made it up. Yep, I got a call, and I'm confident it was our CEO, and it must have been a deep fake voice. So I didn't fall 
for a business email scam. I'm not stupid. I wouldn't fall for a scam like that. This was a completely new kind of an attack using machine learning, and anybody would have fallen for this, which is a good story for the victim to defend themselves. Is this going to happen in the future? Sure, as it becomes easy enough to do. Within a couple of years, it will. But I don't think it has happened yet. I'm not believing it until we see some evidence. And what this means is that we can't always blame the user. We shouldn't always blame the user. We can take all of the attacks, all of the breaches, and all of the leaks we've ever seen, and they are all either user error or a technical error. So it could be a vulnerability in the systems, programming error, or it could be the user doing stupid sh sh stuff. And as long as we blame the users for doing stupid stuff, they will keep hiding what they did wrong. They will keep coming up with lies. And that's not what we want either. So, of course, the, the solution is education, but education is hard. Education almost always fails. People never learn anything and pay attention. I'm doing education right now as I'm telling you that education never works. So what works? Well, examples work. One of the recent examples I've seen, which I think works really well, is this new site, new service called Skit. This is the way you can educate developers and coders who use services like GitHub and explain to them why it's problematic when you use, you know, exchange API keys with your colleagues by pasting them for just a second into GitHub. Because this service, which is called Skit, is online right now, watching everything committed to all Git services, including GitLab and GitHub. And whenever someone posts an API key or a Google uh, authentication key or SSL private keys or passwords or you know, a string with a lot of random characters, so it could be a password, it just posts it online for everybody to see. And the way you can use this to educate your developers is just to show it to them. That's all they need to do. They see, oh, holy hell, there's this service which does this automatically. And if I just paste an API key there for a second, it's going to be there for the whole world to see. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Yes, you shouldn't do that. And this is a great way to educate it. But education is hard. It's hard, but it's not as hard as trying to defend against the technical vulnerabilities. Because in the end, technical vulnerabilities are just bugs in the code. Programming errors, that's what they are. That's all they are. And we've always had bugs. We always will have bugs in our code. Well, we will have them as long as our programs are written by human beings. And of course, eventually they will not be written by human beings. But for the foreseeable future, they will be, and there will be bugs. And that's why patching. We keep talking about patching and uh, maintenance and updates and all that. And then we wonder why it fails. Let me give you an example. Last year, several Finnish cities were hit with large breaches, including ransomware breaches and uh, large outages. Our incident response teams were working with many of those cities as it was happening. One of these cities was breached through their Windows RDP server. They had three Windows RDP servers in the public internet for remote work purposes, set by the IT team. And the IT team perfectly well understood the risks involved with public-facing RDP servers. So they had all kinds of authentication enabled to make sure nobody could use credentials to gain access to them. And then they had set up specific rules, so these three servers had automatic updates enabled, unlike the rest of the network. This just basically meant that any time Microsoft pushed out any update, these servers would get it straight away. Yet, they were breached through one of these servers. Why? 
because it was out of date. How can it be out of date? These machines are on the internet. They have connectivity. They have automatic updates enabled. In fact, it turns out that the problematic server had tried downloading critical updates for the RDP server itself 200 times. And it had failed 200 times. Why did it fail? Well, it failed because the hard drive was full. The hard drive was full. It tried downloading the It was a big patch. It couldn't fit it on the hard drive partition, and it failed. And it tried again 200 times. After 200 times, they got owned, and their network got owned. So how come the IT admins didn't realize that the hard drive is full? Well, this server was part of the educational network of the city, which had 18,000 endpoints. 18,000 machines creating log entries for things like hard drive full. And when you think about it from that point of view, it's, it becomes pretty understandable why this happened. Sure, they were trying to do their best. They were trying to secure their machines. They were trying to update everything. They were trying to go through the logs and fix every machine which was running out of hard drive space. They just run out of time. But there's always a story behind the failures that happen when security fails. And it always looks bad when security fails. But when security doesn't fail, when security works, then nothing happens. This is the dilemma of our work. If we do our work perfectly, if we do our job 100% right, then the end result is that nothing happens. There will not be a headline in the biggest newspaper in Helsinki tomorrow saying that the second largest company in Finland was not hacked yesterday. Like, that's not news. If it is hacked, then you can guarantee it will be on the front page. But if we succeed, it's going to be invisible. I've used the term security Tetris, because we all know the game of Tetris, where all of your successes disappear. And then when you screw up, the screw-ups pile up. That's what we're doing. And rarely is anyone thanked for stopping the disaster that didn't happen. Rarely is anyone thanked for stopping the disaster that did not happen. So I want to thank you for your work. I want to thank you for doing your part in stopping the disasters before they happen. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Let me put a plug in for a thing we're doing later today with Tommy Tuominen. We will have a session at the F-Secure booth on the second floor at 8 p.m. today. In Finnish, kysy herrasmies hakkereilta where we go through an AMA. If you want to ask me and Tommy anything, please join us at 8 p.m. And if you want to ask me something right now, the floor is open. Questions? Please put your hand up. And we have a question right here at the front row. Please wait for the microphone coming right here. Uh, do you have any internet asbestos warning stickers? Indeed, I've lately been speaking about IT asbestos. IT asbestos is the metaphor for what we're doing right now with IoT. Because asbestos, the material, was such a great innovation. Is this asbestos? Motherfucker. <laughs> Thank you. Have a punch card. Yeah, it's not asbestos, it's asbestos stickers. So I think it's a fair, fair deal. So the thing about IT asbestos is that asbestos really seemed like a great idea when it was innovated. So we put it everywhere, into every building. And then we realized two decades later, it was a bad idea. 
which is what we're doing right now by putting IoT into everything. So it is the IT asbestos and uh, our kids will curse us for implementing this, what, well, right now. Questions? Put your hands up. There in the back. Thank you. Please wait for the microphone. There's so many people in here. Hi. So regarding the pre-crime you showed earlier, um, I kind of think that you missed a point in the, that's been done for many years in the sense of correlating where crime happens and how to improve uh, action on it. But the dangerous part is kind of when law trusts um, these algorithms to enforce something before it happens. So kind of how can we, who know the technology, um, not let law cross the boundary to go to that kind of that point where they trust algorithms more than evidence and previous normal social behavior, basically. You are now under arrest for a future murder. You do have a great point, though. We, when we build machine learning, they are as good as the data we give them. And in these cases, we typically give them data with biases. Biases created by humans. Like, you know, we think that those people create more crimes than those people because they look different or live in the wrong place. And then, of course, the algorithms learn that. This is potentially very, very problematic. But uh, I'm sure there's plenty of research being done in this space. But it does really remind me of the science fiction movies based on stories from 1956. More questions. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I would like, uh, how will the IT security landscape look like in five years, in your opinion? Well, in five years, it's such a short time that the changes won't be that big. Um, I already made the call about machine learning in the hands of criminals being, you know, in the near future. So maybe that's, that's a good forecast to make, that in five years, we have crossed the threshold where we are starting to see attacks which are using machine learning. Machine learning still requires a bit of expertise. Within a couple of years, the barriers of entry are becoming so low that any idiot will be able to do machine learning, and then any idiot will be doing machine learning, and we will start seeing malware and other attacks using machine learning. So that's my forecast. And we'll take one more question before we break. One more question right there. Thank you very much. Would you say that maybe rather than any idiot doing the machine learning, there will be stuff sold at the darknet marketplace by the less idiotic people to the idiotic people, and then all hell will break loose? I hate the way you think. You're under arrest for a future murder. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what's going to happen, and that's one of the problems we have. And with that, have a great disobey. Thank you very much.